Planning is a key element to any successful project, automotive or otherwise. Yet it's so often ignored and the outcome unsurprisingly shows it. Welcome to the second instalment of our Project Panhard build, where we're detailing the planning, wiring, configuration and tuning of a Toyota 86 that's had a 1U ZFV V8 fitted in place of the stock FA20. I'm Andre from the High Performance Academy and in this video you'll learn what it takes to plan a project like this. You'll see how we designed the wiring harness and we'll cover the mounting of some of the hardware we mentioned in the last video. The first step for us was to plan out how we are going to connect the ECU to the new 1U ZFE V8 engine. We'd already decided to use the MoTeC adapter harness that connects the ECU to the car's wiring loom inside the cabin to keep the wiring job manageable and speed up the project's timeline. This did require a little bit of work though to ensure we had enough outputs to control an engine with twice the number of cylinders. While the adapter loom was going to need a little work, the biggest job was going to be constructing a new engine harness. When it came to the engine harness, the simplest and most cost effective solution was for us to build a new harness from the factory bulkhead connector. If the budget allowed, we could have repinned the body side harness into an Autosport connector. However, this was an unnecessary expense in our case. Once we deleted the direct injection outputs and the unused cam control outputs destined for the FA20 engine, we could then reassign these for additional injector and ignition outputs that we needed for our V8 engine. In the perfect world, we would have been able to purchase new terminals for the Toyota bulky connector, but finding obscure or unique terminals isn't always easy, and it's not a part you can order through your local Toyota dealership. In the end, our option was to splice our new harness into the existing wiring in the factory connector. Now, with the current buzz on social media of people posting up concentrically twisted engine harnesses, beautifully terminated and expensive Autosport connectors, this might be considered by some as a little half-assed. This is the real world though, and a properly crimped wire splice can be very reliable, with the splice actually having more strength than the base wires. While we are splicing our new harness into the existing wires, we will be using mil-spec wire for constructing our harness, as well as Raychem DR25 as a protective sheath. We'll give you more details about these choices and why we made them in the next video. Before we pick up a set of wire strippers or a crimping tool though, we need a complete plan of how we'll approach the wiring and which wire will go to which terminal. This is a time consuming process, but the time spent here will pay dividends later and ensure we don't make any mistakes and we'll have documentation to refer back to later if we need to fault find anything. The problem with using DR25 as a protective sheath is that there is no way of adding additional wires later on if we make a mistake. This makes proper planning even more essential. There are a few options when it comes to designing the engine harness depending what resources you have access to. If you have a factory workshop manual, then often this will include pinout information for the ECU and bulkhead connectors. If you're dealing with a car that's sold in multiple countries, often there are subtle differences between wire colours and pin locations that can trip you up. In our case, we chose the slightly more labour intensive method of back probing the harness with a meter to confirm pin locations. This data was then transferred to a spreadsheet where we could detail the pin location, function and the corresponding pin location on the MoTeC ECU. Once we'd completed this spreadsheet, we could compare the original functions with what we needed to run our 1U ZFE V8 engine. Reallocating functions sometimes does mean that pins need to be swapped at the ECU connector too, as for example an ignition output to control a coil needs to be connected to one of the ignition drives on the ECU. With all of the required inputs and outputs assigned, we even had enough spare inputs to wire our fuel pressure and oil pressure sensors back through the bulkhead connector. This keeps the installation neat as there's only one harness to disconnect if the engine needs to come out. With the wiring spreadsheet complete, we moved on to mounting our hardware. 
This started with the M1 ECU, which isn't provided with any easy means of mounting. We removed the factory ECU bracket and managed to bolt the M150 on in place of the stock ECU. This tucks the ECU out of the way and keeps the interior tidy. We also needed to mount the lambda sensors into the exhaust system so that we could measure the air fuel ratio. The hard work was already done here as the exhaust system already had fittings welded into each bank. It's important when mounting these sensors to make sure they are mounted horizontally or above. If the sensor is mounted to the underside of the exhaust, it can be damaged by moisture, reducing sensor life. We ran the lambda sensors into the engine bay and mounted the LTC control unit and MAP sensor to the firewall behind the battery. This keeps them both close to the engine, but will protect them from excessive heat. To mount these components, we use riv nuts, which is a tidy way of adding a threaded hole into panel steel, providing a neat and professional result. The last job was to mount our fuel pressure and oil pressure sensors. Ideally with the fuel pressure sensor, we want to be monitoring fuel pressure at the fuel rail, which is the pressure that the injectors will see. In some situations, room in the engine bay will dictate where we can physically mount the sensor, but in our case, a neat solution was to drill and tap the blanking cap for the passenger's side fuel rail. We sealed the fuel pressure sensor with a Teflon thread paste and fitted a new aluminium sealing washer before putting everything back together. With the fuel pressure sensor fitted, the MoTeC ECU can make fueling adjustments based on actual fuel pressure, and this helps improve the accuracy of the tune. The MoTeC M1 also has to have the correct data for the injectors fitted to the engine. For the M1's volumetric efficiency fuel model to work accurately, it's essential that the ECU knows what mass of fuel is delivered for a certain injector pulse width. To get this data, we sent a couple of injectors to MoTeC in Melbourne where they could run them on their special test bench to generate the right data for us. This isn't something you want to leave until the last minute. So at the end of the planning stage, we have all of the hardware mounted in the car, which enables us to plan the lengths of wire we need for each branch of the harness. We've gone through and made a document which allocates a pin on the bulky connector to an input or output on the new V8 engine, and we've made sure they're connected to the correct pin on the MoTeC M1. In the next instalment, you'll be able to follow through as we create the new wiring harness. We'll show you a couple of wiring techniques we use, detail the materials we've chosen for the job, and take you one step closer to being able to fire up the engine for the very first time.